You cannot submit your quilt into a quilt show, let alone win a ribbon, if you didn't do the binding by hand. I know I heard that for years. So my mind was blown when the off-kilter crafter Ian told me that his binding is always done by machine. And he's won some ribbons for his beautiful quilts. Hey friends, welcome back to my sewing room. My name is Becca and in today's video I wanted to talk about binding. I love the look of hand binding, but if I'm being completely honest with you, I don't love the time, the energy, or the patience that it takes to do it. In fact, I don't love it so much that I've never done it. Ain't nobody got time for this. I do 100% of my binding on machine and that's what I want to show you today. We're going to walk through two different techniques that you can use to attach your binding to your quilt and still have it look good. And spoiler alert, one of these techniques is the one that Ian uses in his award-winning quilts. Okay, so these quilts are not going to bind themselves. Let's get to it. Both of these quilts are back from the long armor. They're beautifully quilted and they're squared up. And all I have to do is attach the binding for them to be complete. While I'm working on a quilt top, if I know what fabric is going to be used for the binding, I will at least cut my binding strips when I'm cutting the rest of the fabric and I'll hold on to it with that quilt project's supplies. So you can see for the quilt down here, I already knew what my binding strips were going to be. It's this really beautiful bluish purple batik, which goes quite nicely with this. It's going to be a great frame for the quilt. I have my strips cut, but I never really prepared the binding, so I'll still have to do that. For this other quilt, however, I have no idea what I want to bind it with, and that's where this bin comes into play. This is what I call my bin of misfit bindings. Everything that's in here are binding strips or binding fabric that's already been prepared that don't have a home. It doesn't have a quilt identified for it yet. So what do I put in here? Well, if I buy binding from a quilt shop, like I did at QuiltCon last year, if it doesn't have a home, it goes in there. If I cut strips for binding and I went in a different direction, I'll put that in there. Or if I made a ton of binding for a quilt project and I have any amount of scrap, that goes in here too. So before I go to my shelves and start grabbing fabric to make binding strips, I like to go to this bin and see if I have some scrap binding that will be enough for this quilt. And I do actually kind of like the way this looks with the quilt. This is an old fabric line from Lolo Boutique. And this is a fabric from one of Lolo Boutique's newer fabric lines and the colors really seem to work well together. So I think I'm going to use this to bind this quilt. Before we get started making our lovely binding, we have to make sure there is enough here to cover all four sides of the quilt. Because this fabric was not set aside as binding for this quilt, we're not sure if there's going to be enough, so we do have to do that quilt math. The math for this is really simple. You just need to take the perimeter of the quilt and add about 20 inches, and that's how much binding length that you need. But in this case, all of my binding is still just cut strips, so I've got to take that one step further. I need to know how many strips of width of fabric do I need to make that binding. The perimeter of this quilt is 264 inches, and when I add my 20, that means I need binding that is going to be about 284 inches. The way I figure out how many strips I need is I take the amount of binding that I need, in this case 284 inches, and I divide it by 40 inches, which is the usual width of fabric that you get when you're working from selvage to selvage. When I do that, I get 7.1, and so I'm going to round up to 8. That'll give me enough room to join all of my seams together and make my binding strip. Now, if I would have gotten 7.5 or 7.6, I may have even chose to round up to 9 just to give myself a little bit extra playroom. I always like to err on the side of caution when I'm making my binding, and that's why I have a bin of misfit bindings because I always end up with scrap. So I have counted all of my binding strips and I'm lucky because I have enough here to bind that quilt. But if I wasn't lucky enough, I'd have to know how much yardage I need 
to cut my eight strips of binding. Well, that's really simple. You're going to take the width of the fabric that you're going to use for your binding. Most people do a two and a half inch width, and you're going to multiply that by the number of strips that you need. In this case, I needed eight. So if I multiplied 2.5 times eight, I'm going to end up with 20 inches. And so I would be looking for at least two thirds of a yard of fabric. That's going to give me some extra playroom, but you don't want anything less than that because then you're not going to have enough to bind your quilt. Now that I have my binding all cut out, it's time to join my strips together to make one nice long binding strip. You can do that one of two ways. The easiest way is just to put them right sides together and take a seam about a quarter inch away from this short edge. Definitely going to do the trick, but it will add some bulk to your binding. And I don't like to do it that way. I like to join it on the diagonal. To join the fabric on the diagonal, I take my first strip and I lay it out so that the bulk of it's going off to the left and the edge that I am attaching to is laid directly in front of me. Then I take my strip that I'm going to add to the one laying on the table and I put it right side down and I make sure that there's an overlap here and an overlap here of about an eighth of an inch or so. That's going to allow me to see kind of a little cut out in the corner so I can keep a better eye on that point. I'm going to bring you in nice and close so that you can see exactly what I'm talking about. This little L shape right here in that bottom left corner of this area, that's where I want to start my stitching. And then down here, you can see that same little kind of cutout shape. This right in that corner, that's where I want to end my stitching. So I could wing it if I was really good at keeping control of my machine. I could start stitching here, go all the way down and stop stitching there. But if I'm not so good at winging it, you'll want to come in with a ruler line it up with each of those points, draw a line, and stitch on the line. I have been doing this long enough that I feel like I'm okay without marking my stitching line, but I also have some diagonal seam tape on my machine, which is super helpful for projects like this. That diagonal seam tape has a red center line that, when installed, lines up perfectly with your needle. And so if I put that little point right where my needle is, at the top and then the other little point at the bottom right on that red line and I keep the bottom part right on that red line as I'm stitching, I'm going to go straight. I'm going to get that perfect 45 degree stitch. Once we have all of our strips sewn together, we've got to cut about a quarter inch away from that seam that we just took and I find a good pair of scissors for this is just as good as anything. You don't have to be super accurate. You just need to make sure that you leave about a quarter inch away from that stitching line. And you're going to do this for every one of those seams. Now, if you wanted to, you could totally grab your rotary cutter and ruler. I just feel like that's too much muss and too much fuss for something that doesn't need to be an accurate trim. The next step is to take all of this and press it in half lengthwise. There are some notions on the market that will help with this step. They'll make it a little bit easier. The notion will hold the fabric while you kind of pull it under or pull it through and the iron sits on top. But I find even those notions are still a little bit finicky. And so I don't always reach for them. A lot of times I'll just kind of do what you see me doing here. I do enough of the binding strip to cover my ironing board and then I move on to the next one. I do want to point out one thing though. When I get to one of those seams where I have joined my strips, I will take the time to just press that open and then I'll fold it down in half. By pressing that seam open, I'm helping to make my binding lay even flatter and distribute that bulk even more. That's how you're going to get the best results with your binding is if you joined all of your pieces on the diagonal and then press those seams open. One week later. Do not adjust your picture quality because I really am wearing a different shirt. This whole process took so long that by the time it was done, I had to take a week's long vacation from my quilt. 
seriously, making this stuff is pretty time consuming. And I like to cut corners when I can. And that is why when I'm out and about, if I see somebody selling pre made binding, I will definitely pick it up, especially if it is with a neutral fabric that I know I can make work with a variety of different quilts. It's also why I treat any of my scrap bindings like gold and try to fit them into other projects. Now that we have this all nicely pressed, I'm going to show you how I attach them onto the quilt. And I've got two different methods for you with this. We're going to put our binding onto the quilt in just a moment. But before we do, I want to let you know that the tips I'm going to give to you are exactly the same, regardless of whether you're following method number one or method number two. So it's important to pay attention to this. The only difference is for method number one, we're going to attach to the back side of our quilt and then flip it around to the front. And for method number two, we're going to attach to the front of the quilt and flip it around to the back. Let's get started. I'm going to grab my quilt and lay it right side down so the back side is facing up and I want to make sure that the quilt is as even as possible with the bed of my machine. And I want to make sure all of my quilt is on that surface. If it isn't even with the machine, I would rather it be higher rather than lower. And the reason for that is gravity. If this quilt, any part of it is lower than the bed of the machine, I'm going to have some drag. And that means I'm going to have to wrestle the weight of the quilt while I'm maneuvering it underneath my needle. And nobody needs to do that. Then I'm going to grab my binding strip and I'm going to find one of the edges. I'm going to pull off probably about 10 or so inches. Doesn't have to be exact. I just need a good length. I want to turn it around so that the folded edges are lined up with that nice raw edge of my quilt. Before I get started, I do like to point out I use a seam guide to help keep all of this nice and straight. I set it at about three eighths of an inch. And then once that's in place, I grab my binding strip and that extra long tail that we pulled off to allow us to join our seams later is just going to hang out back there. I'm going to line up the raw edges of my binding with the raw edge of the quilt. I'll take a few stitches, a back stitch, and then I'll go forward probably about six inches or so. And then I'll back stitch again, cut my thread, and this is the important part. I want to test my binding to make sure that when I flip this over, it's going to cover the line of stitching that was left when I secured it to the back. So I like to pull it off at this point and just roll it from the back over to the front and make sure that when I'm holding it down with my fingers, I don't see that seam there anywhere. Also, if there are any points that I want to make sure that my binding doesn't cover like this one, this is a great chance for me to see, did I have it too far over or was it not over enough because I can adjust my seam at this point. The biggest, most important part of this is really just making sure that you're covering up the stitching that was left behind when you attached your binding from the back. If you find that you can still see your line of stitching after you test flip it over, it just means that your seam on the back is a little too big. You want to make it a little bit smaller. For me, this seam was perfect, so I'm going to continue stitching at that exact seam allowance. As I'm stitching along, I want to make sure I know where that quarter inch mark is away from the edge of the quilt. So it's usually a good idea to put a little mark on your binding so you know where to stop stitching because you want this seam to end about a quarter inch away from the edge of the quilt where you're going to turn. Once I get there, I just take a couple of back stitches so that the seam doesn't pop, cut my thread, and then I do a little bit of origami. I want to fold this salvage so that I get a nice mitered corner on both sides of the quilt. I do that by taking this tail of binding and folding it out. I'm going to check to make sure that I'm making a 45 degree line right here on the fold and that the raw edge of the binding lines up with the raw edge of the trimmed quilt. Then I'm going to take this binding and fold it on top of itself. And I'm going to check three things to make sure that I did that right. First, I want to make sure that these two folded edges are lined up nice with each other. 
This fold that I just created is lined up with this side of the quilt and the raw edges for the binding down here are lined up with that part of the quilt. Then I'm going to turn this over very gently, take it back to my sewing machine and stitch all the way down. I'll repeat that process every time I come to a corner. Are you kidding me? Oh, I'm coming back some other time. I ran out of bobbin thread. So I lost bobbin chicken last night and I had to walk away, but I am back at it today. I've got the binding attached to all four sides of the quilt and I am coming up on the part where I started. And I want to take this moment to show you how I join those two ends together. I do like to leave a good bit of space between the two ends and I make sure that I have back stitched at the start and finish of each end just so it can hold up to a little bit of stress. I don't know exactly how much room this is. I just kind of measure it by hands. If I can fit two hands in here spread out, then I know I've got enough room. I want to make sure that I've got an overlap that is the width of my binding. And you can do this a couple of ways. If you know that this is a two and a half inch strip, then you can just lay these out on top of one another, measure two and a half inches and cut off the excess. But I like to make sure that I have exactly the right amount. So I get a pair of scissors and I slice off a little piece. Usually it's the selvage end if I've left it on there. And I open it up and lay it down just like that. Then I'm going to take my other piece and I'm going to lay it on top. So now I've got the end and the beginning ends laying on top of one another. And wherever I have this little piece of fabric, I'm going to trim. From the top piece, I want to trim on the left side of that little piece of fabric. I'll line it back up. Things sometimes get shifted around. It is important that when you're doing this, your quilt, by the way, is laying nice and flat. And then I'm going to pick it up and I'm going to trim on the right side of that for the one underneath. Now I will make sure that it is just a thread or two smaller or narrower than the width of this. I feel like that just gives me a nice tighter binding. Then I'm going to navigate the quilt so that it's kind of off to the left side. I'm going to bring this over here and open up my binding so that I have it going off the same direction that I did when I was creating my binding strips. Then I'm going to pull this piece down. I'm going to open it up and I'm going to make a backwards L with this. Just like I did before, I do let it overlap by just a hair or two. And I'm going to start in that corner and stitch at a 45 degree angle all the way down here. Now, if this is a problem for you and you don't want to join it on the diagonal, you can always bump it up against one another just like this. You can crease where the seam is with your finger Take this to the machine and stitch with these right sides together right on that crease. That's going to give you a straight seam so it'll have more bulk. That's why I prefer to do it on the diagonal. Now I will say as you're coming to your machine and you're stitching this, you may find that it's a little difficult to get the binding to lay right. Just make sure to smush and fold and do all the things with the quilt. I find if I fold it in half where there's no binding, I usually get it to cooperate with me a little bit more. Once I've stitched that, then I want to open it up and make sure that this lays flat. I don't want to trim anything yet. So I'm going to spread my quilt out on a flat surface and I'm going to press the seam open lay it over. And what I'm looking for is that there's no gap. I want to make sure that this lays nice and flat on the quilt. If it does, then I can come in with my scissors, trim off this excess fabric. I will press that seam open with my fingers, close it back up, and then I'm going to come and stitch at that same three eighths of a seam allowance all the way down here so that the binding is attached to the whole side of the quilt. And just like that, 
We're ready to flip it over. All of that works great if you are working on a bigger project, but sometimes we're binding a smaller project and it can be really difficult to get those two ends to lay nicely together and get them closed up. So I've got a hack that I want to show you. For the purposes of this demonstration, we're going to pretend that this is the tail that we left when we started our binding. And this is the fabric or the binding that we have as we're wrapping up. When we get close to the point where we're approaching the tail that we left behind, we're just going to open that tail up and then we're going to take that short edge and fold it so that it's along this edge of the fabric and crease this down. You should have a nice 45 degree fold. Then we're going to fold it back up. And if you wanted to, you could totally hit this with a hot iron just to make the fold lay a little bit flatter. Then we're going to take the tail of the end part of our binding and we're going to tuck it inside of here and make sure that this goes about an inch or two past where this line, this short edge is. When we fold this back over, everything should be nice and tidy. I'm going to make sure that it's all nice and continuous, nice and flush here. And then I'll take it back to my sewing machine and stitch just along this edge, just like I normally would have. When we're done with the binding and it's folded over, you will have a little tiny pocket here, but all the raw edges are tucked in quite a bit. So it shouldn't give you any fraying or any other issues. And if this bothers you, you can always stitch it closed with some coordinating thread. And now it's time for the final part for this technique. It's just stitching the binding down to the front of the quilt, but I have a special tool that's going to make that easier. This is a left compensating foot, and I absolutely love this for my binding. This has a ledge or a wedge here that is designed to bump up against seam bulk. And so what happens is when I put this foot onto my machine and I pull the binding around to the front, that wedge lines itself up nicely with that fold of my binding and helps the needle go into my binding just a couple threads to the right of that fold. And if I really want to hide my stitching on this binding, I can get a thread that matches my binding color. Now, I'll be honest with you, you don't need this foot to do this technique. You can, if you wanted to, fold that fabric around to the front and just very carefully edge stitch all the way around your binding. But what I find happens when I do that, even if I press it and glue baste it down, I tend to veer off of the binding onto the quilt top every so often. And then I have to go back, rip those stitches out and restitch down. This is a game changer for me because that wedge bumps up against the binding. I can have confidence that I'm right where I need to be and get through my binding a whole lot faster and not have any gaps in the stitching. Now, if you're following along with this technique, all you have to do is fold that binding around to the front and stitch it down. In the past, I have definitely folded it over as I went, but you are more than welcome to take this to your iron and press the binding out away from the back to get a more crisp finish. And then if you wanted to, you could fold it around to the front and clip it around the entire perimeter of the quilt. I've done that too. The only thing you want to make sure of is when you fold, you just want to make sure that when you fold your binding over to the front of the quilt, that you're covering those lines of stitching that were left behind from attaching the binding to the back of the quilt. If you have a computerized machine, this is a great opportunity to put some of those fancy stitches to use. As you pull around the binding to the front, you can pick a stitch that you really love, and you can let that be a beautiful decorative edge around the front of your quilt. This wouldn't be a good binding video if I didn't show you how I get that miter corner on the front of the quilt when I'm pulling it around to finish off my binding. Let me show you at the machine. As I'm approaching the last few inches of one of my sides, I like to grab the bottom part of my quilt and flip it up. And I'll just kind of hold that down with my fingers and then I'm going to take the side and fold it over and I'm going to mess with this little corner until I have that perfect 45 degree line that comes up. Once that's in place, I'll grab a clip and hold it down. And the reason why I do this 
before I get too close to the end is because I feel like the binding on the bottom and the binding on the side is going to cooperate with me a whole lot more if it's not already stitched down. Now, if you find that when you're trying to fold this over, it just doesn't want to line up, you may need to consider folding the side in and then pulling the bottom up. One of those ways is going to give you less bulk. Go with that option. If one of them's not working, try the other. Once you do have that 45 degree line though, it's always important just to kind of clip it and then you'll keep stitching. Then as I get close to that corner, I'll take the clip off. I'll do one last check to make sure everything's nice and lined up. Hold it in place. And then once my needle is in that little crease that's holding the bottom and the top binding, I'll keep my needle down, pivot 90 degrees, and then continue on the next side. In technique number two, this is the same process that we just did for technique number one, but there are two important changes. The first one is we're going to attach our binding to the front side of the quilt. Don't question me, just do it. And the second one is when we put our binding onto the quilt, we're going to use a quarter inch seam allowance. This is the technique that Ian, the off-kilter crafter, uses for all of his award-winning quilts and the binding method that I would choose to use if I were submitting a quilt into a quilt show. For the purposes of technique number two demonstration, we're going to pretend that the binding is attached to all four sides of our quilt, even though I really only have about eight inches or so attached. Once you have the binding attached to the front of the quilt, you're going to take it to your iron and press it out away from the quilt. And then you'll flip the whole quilt over and we're going to pull it around to the back and really hold it in place. You can hold this down with clips or pins, whatever works for you, but I like to use glue. This is the Acorn fabric glue, but you could use Roxanne's glue based it, Soline glue, Elmer's glue, any water soluble glue product will work. The trick here is that you want to make sure that this binding is pulled nice and taut and that folded line for your binding is coming down a few threads past that stitching line, probably about three or four threads past it. Then once you have it in place and you know where it's going to go, you're going to draw a small line of glue along the edge of the quilt and you're going to pull that binding back over and really cook it in with a hot iron. You're going to do that around the entire perimeter of the quilt. Like I said, you can use clips to hold this in place or you could just tuck it as you go, but I did find that gluing it down to the back side of the quilt, while it took more effort and was definitely time consuming, it did yield better results. Once it's glued in place in the back, you could pass it on to a friend to hand stitch it to the back if you'd like, or you can just finish it yourself using a stitch in the ditch foot. This is a stitch in the ditch foot, and this is what makes this technique a whole lot easier. Of course, you could go around the entire perimeter of this and try to stitch in the ditch just by using your normal presser foot and your eyeball, but this is going to make it a whole lot easier. A stitch in the ditch foot has a little ledge or a little, little flange that kind of sticks out the bottom of the foot right in between the two sides. And it's designed so that that flange is going to bump up against your seam and it's going to allow the needle to come directly down into the seam. So as I'm stitching along, that little ledge is going to be bumping up against my seam and the needle is going to go right into that seam. You're not even going to see the stitching from the front. As long as you have pulled this around to the back past that line of stitching that you saw on the back of the quilt, you're going to secure the binding to the back and you're not going to see the stitching from the front. So those are the two techniques that I use to bind 100% of my machine bound quilts. And if I'm being completely honest with you, 
Technique number one is my go-to. The reason for that is because when I gift a quilt, my intention is for the recipient to love that quilt, to wash it, to abuse it, and to use it. Let's face it, if the quilt wears out, I can always make them another one. If I'm going to put the extra muss and fuss and time into the binding, it's because that quilt is a little extra special and intended to be on display. Speaking of technique number two, if you're not already following my friend Ian from the Off Kilter Crafter, you'll want to do that because I know he is working on a video tutorial where he walks you through his binding method. I'll link to his channel in the description box below if you haven't checked him out already. Thank you friends so much for hanging out with me tonight. If you got a tip, trick, giggle or laugh in today's video, I would love it if you give me a thumbs up, subscribe, and leave me a comment down below. Stay tuned for some footage of these quilts after they were fully bound. I'll see you guys all in the next video. Bye!